But we are looking this evening at this subject above all else. And in previous sessions, just to give you a recap, um, we have so far covered these. So we began by thinking about what it meant to be brave enough to follow Jesus. Um, so particularly Jesus' call to come and follow me. Then we jumped into this with Jez, thinking about what it meant to have a life of abundant blessing. And then Beth uh, helped us think about what it is to live distinctively, particularly as salt and light um, in that short passage. And then last time, Tim Forrester was helping us think about the renovation of our hearts and particularly how Jesus uh, took what was uh, what was being said by the Jewish leaders of the time and really pointed them back to what it, what God had really intended with his various different laws. Um, so that's where we're going. I want to start with this, um, particularly the first part. So Jesus in Matthew 22 quotes from Deuteronomy 6, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And I think we'd all agree that to do that is very challenging. Jesus wants, wants us to love him above all else. But we know that there's all sorts of things that complete that compete for our love. So I tried to brainstorm what some of these might be. And here's my here's my short list of, of things. And um, so top left, I think I was trying to think of control and particularly kind of uh, wanting control over others. Um, we've got the kind of swimming pool, kind of wealth, uh, wealthy lifestyle, living it up. We've got the kind of chess, the victory at the top, kind of being able to kind of overcome in difficult situations. We've got fame, we've got money. Uh, notice the European notes there, um, just for you, Katerina and Letitia. Um, down the bottom right, we've got love or relationships. And um, we've got new kinds of experiences. I don't know if you particularly want to jump out of a plane or not. Uh, we've got sporting success. Maybe down the bottom left, a kind of quiet lifestyle or, again, living it up. Um, eat, drink and be merry kind of stuff. And I wonder whether there would be things that you would add to that list. I'm going to give you a chance to talk about that in a moment. Um, but first of all, I want to show you this quote from James Smith. Um, he's some uh, philosopher and he writes, we're essentially and ultimately desiring animals, which is simply to say that we are essentially and ultimately lovers. To be human is to love and it is what we love that defines who we are. We are talking about ultimate loves. In other words, what we desire above all else, the ultimate desire that shapes and positions and makes sense of all our penultimate desires and actions. It's quite a challenging quote there, but just notice the idea of ultimate loves. And August, Augustine says that in order to discover the character of any people, we only have to observe what they love. So we're going to talk about this a bit in groups, and um, I guess we'll jump into two groups now, if that's OK, Stephen. And um, the first question is about your day to day life. And what does that say about what you really love and desire? And then you may also like to talk about your friends, both whether they're Christians and non-Christians. What do their lives reveal about what they really love and desire? Um, so if we can just have probably five minutes on that, Stephen, just to get us going and then we'll come back together. Let's keep moving then, shall we? Um, so you'll be pleased to know that tonight we've got a much shorter passage than we had last time. So we've got five verses as opposed to, I don't know, more like 60. Um, but there's still plenty for us to chew on. And the language that Jesus uses in this passage um, leads me to three nice, neat headings. Two treasures, 
two visions, two masters. I think we can remember that, can't we? Two treasures, two visions, two masters. A treasure is anything of great value. And to treasure something means to take good care of something um, because we, we value it highly. So I really like this picture of the little girl with the bear. And, you know, you really get the idea that she treasures it. Um, but this this language is used in the Bible in different ways. So Matthew 13, remember the parable of the treasure in the field and the man goes and sells everything he has so that he can buy the field. Um, or Mary talking about some of the things that happened in early in uh, with her pregnancy. She, it says that she pondered all these things in her heart. Um, or Moses, long before the time of Jesus, uh, we're told in Hebrews that he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ uh, as of greater values than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his great reward. So lots of ways that we use the word treasure. Um, but tonight, um, what we're particularly thinking about is what's, what's shown in the picture of the girl. So something that we prize most dearly, like clinging to that bear. So uh, to the two treasures first, then, shall we? Um, let's just read that. Um, it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth uh, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Uh, Stephen was very kind to give me a picture of his flat. And um, you really get this idea of storing up things and that's or laying up things for ourselves. That's the kind of key message in what Jesus is saying. Um, I don't think Jesus is saying that it's wrong to have these treasures, but rather that we need to keep them in perspective. He's not, for example, prohibiting uh, having clothes or things or money. Um, but no, it's more than about the love of things, of clothes or money. And the danger is we make those things our treasure. Treasure on earth, then. Um, treasure on earth. Characterised there by insecurity, temperance, fragility. The question is not so much whether uh, they will last, but how long they will last. They can be destroyed by moths or vermin, even rust, uh, some translations say. And the picture perhaps is of a farm, farm's produce with the supplies uh, being eroded, corroded, fouled or destroyed. But even the treasures that don't fade in this manner can certainly be stolen by thieves. Earthly treasure is therefore anything uh, which is perishable or which can be lost in some way. Again, Jesus is not saying that any of this is intrinsically bad, but rather that they have no ultimate value. Perhaps someone could read uh, this passage for me. Who'd like to volunteer? Go for it. Go on, Daniel. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kind of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Thanks, Daniel. It's quite a similar plea, isn't it? That we be content with what we have rather than making the pursuit of certain things ultimate. Jesus speaks very strongly here about money. But contrary to how that is often mistakenly quoted, what Jesus says that is the love of money is a root, a root of all kinds of evils. I'm reminded too of the parable of the uh, of the guy with the bigger barns uh, in in Luke 12 
Um, the guy who comes to Jesus, he wants him to tell his brother to divide his inheritance with him. And Jesus responds saying, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he tells him a parable about a rich man who has a bumper harvest. And the rich man concludes that he would tear down his barns, build bigger ones and to store up the extra grain. Here we are. And then he says, I'll say to myself, you'll have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So a, a really vivid picture of a man who was storing up things for himself. He wanted to take it easy. He wanted to eat, drink and be merry. But he hadn't been rich towards God. I find this uh, example of Boris Becker quite, um, quite chilling, really. Um, Boris Becker won Wimbledon three times. And after the second, he said, I'd won Wimbledon twice before. Once as the youngest player, I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the song of old movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything, and yet they are so in unhappy. I had no inner peace. I was a puppet on a string. So that's treasure on earth then. And um, now we turn to treasure in heaven. And um, we'll break into groups again in a moment. Um, but first, just to, just to say that treasure in heaven is clearly characterized in these verses as being uh, as about being uh, having security, having eternal value, being incorruptible. These are things that are going to last. They can't be destroyed by moths or vermin. <laughs> by the way. Um, and they can't be stolen by thieves. The question is, what are these treasures? What are these treasures? And we're going to talk about this a bit. Just to give you a couple of quotes first, though. Spurgeon said, you must keep all earthly treasures out of, out of your heart and let Christ be your treasure and let him have your heart. Quite like that one. And then David Guzek says, treasures in heaven give enjoyment now but in the contentment and sense of well-being that comes from being a giver. But their ultimate enjoyment comes on the other side of eternity. OK, we're going to jump into groups. And um, if we can divide these up as following. Um, so perhaps Stephen's group can take Mark 10. 17 to 13, look at the rich young ruler. And uh, my group will look at 1 Timothy 6. And then if you run out of time, you can look at the power of the shrewd manager. But it's it is a bit of a can of worms, that one. So focus on the other one primarily. So, Stephen, can we have another, let's say, let's say six minutes in groups? Can we start with the rich young man then? Um, so this was. Stephen, your group, is someone able to give us a quick summary? I've put the kind of relevant bits on the screen there. Watch some of it. Really, there was no mention of particular material wealth or anything like that. The main bit seems to be promising eternal life, which, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I'm not claiming, oh dear, but it's, it's interesting. We also noticed he promised persecutions at the end as well, but uh, not in the not in the eternal life, of course. But, uh, uh, but you have missed out the other things he promises, so verse 30 who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time in this houses. time though indeed that doesn't is that does that count as laying up treasures in heaven though 
Yeah, I guess that's that's a good point. But it is interesting how the the rewards do come now, but a foretaste of what's to come in the future. Yes, definitely. Your um, question didn't talk about what was treasure on Earth. That's why no, we don't talk true. about it. That is true. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anything else you want to add or should we move on to the second passage? I think you can move on. We'll move on then. Okay, second passage was 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Was there someone who wanted to explain this? <laughs> you volunteered me, I thought. <laughs> I did. I didn't, I didn't necessarily mean that you had to do it, but if you'd like to do it, that would be great. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so, I mean, this quite nicely contrasts two things that the rich people could do. Um, in verse 17, they're not to be haughty or arrogant and to set their hopes on their riches. Um, and then in yep. 18, specifically, like to be generous, to be ready to share. Um, and doing this will store up for themselves treasure in heaven. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess there's this this contrast between what you might think of how to store up treasure on Earth, as in look at the number in your bank account and watch it go up, uh, yeah. versus these these things which are objectively spending money. And yeah. Yeah. The, what Timothy says is the the real way to store up treasures for yourself. And I quite like the way it's put that storing up. Uh, a good foundation for the future which um, is quite kind of it's quite countercultural compared to today's like make sure yeah. you're not to say that you shouldn't be saving money for a rainy day but as well as saving money for a rainy day think about storing up for the future this way yeah but the message is that rich is a uh, offer all this promise and the message here is about their uncertainty um, so it's quite different isn't it hmm. okay um and we could talk a lot more about what it means to be rich in good works to be generous and to be ready um ready to share but we will come to that a bit later and anyway so we'll, we'll move on now uh, welcome beth peterson um, if we had have got time, I presume that neither group did. Is that right, Stephen? No. Okay. The, the last passage was the parable of the shrewd manager, which is quite confusing, but it's great that we've got Beth to explain it. <laughs> um, no, not really. I won't make Beth explain this. This is quite a difficult parable because the because in it, it's you've got... Um, Jesus telling about uh, this manager who's accused of wasting his possessions, his master who's a rich man, calls him to give him, calls him in to give an account of his management. And he, so he's about to lose his job, and but he acts shrewdly so that people would finally welcome into their homes. Um, and that's what we get here. Where is it? Verse, verse nine, I tell you, use worldly worth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings and we could get quite bogged down in this we're not going to um, but the implication as i see it seems to be that we should use our riches our resources all that god's given us now for eternal good we can't take them with us so we should put them to use now jesus point is that the good we do now will last for eternity um, but i leave you to go away and think about that one because It'll probably take you a little while just to get your head around that parable. So we've talked about treasures on earth. We've talked about treasures in heaven. And then comes this little verse at the end, what you might call the heart of the matter. And Jesus is saying here that our treasure and our hearts have to be in the same place. We can't lay up treasures in both because there is a direct conflict. And Jesus says the same thing in that parable that we've just looked at um, at the end of 
in Luke 16. Um, he says, the, power, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And all through the Sermon on the Mount, every session that we've looked at, we've seen that the heart has been in focus. So it's time to once again ask, what is our treasure? What is it that we treasure most in this world? So first thing then, two treasures. We now move on to the second thing, which will be more brief, um, two visions. And... Um, this, this, again, is a slightly tricky section to get our heads around. And the focus shifts from treasure to vision, and specifically whether our eyes are healthy or unhealthy. Your version might say good or, or bad <laughs> eyes, but that's generally the gist. We've only got a few minutes to think about these, um, but I think we'll see that it builds on our core theme. Let me read it. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Some people think that the eye is a lamp for the body in the sense that it enables the body to find its way, rather like the picture on the right. The eye is therefore the source of light in the same way, um, uh, in the way of directing our body towards what is good. Alternatively, we might see the picture as, as the whole person as, as a room or a window in a house. And so the purpose of the eye is to illuminate the house or the room and ensure that it is full of light. The eye of, is therefore the source of light in the same way that a window might function in an otherwise windowless room. And the translator of the message takes this up uh, in his translation. And he says of these verses, he translates it as your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wider in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty eyed in greed, greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. That's the message. And so light comes into our body through our eyes and the health or the goodness of our eyes determines the level of light that comes in. If we are blind, it's a very dark world. But the second question that these verses really ask of us is, about what does Jesus mean by healthy or unhealthy? Option one, and this is, I know this is quite a scary slide. <laughs> I'm not sure it's supposed to. Um, but anyway, this, this slide. Um, option one is that the word healthy or unhealthy means a singleness of purpose or undivided loyalty. And that seems to fit well with the section as a whole, being about being unswerving loyalty to God. Even the part about treasures is not really about treasures, but our attitude towards them. Option two, though, um, is about how the rabbis saw the evil eye as indicating selfishness. And so the, the healthy eye would therefore represent generosity and the, the unhealthy eye represents stinginess. And you'll see that if you look at the NIV, foot, NIV footnote because it says those words. It says uh, generosity and stinginess are what are implied by the words. And so that brings it in line with an overall theme about how we approach material things. Let me say that whichever it is, it's clear that generosity or single-mindedness will bring light into our lives. Contentment leads to greater happiness. And Jesus himself, in the following verse, which I'm stealing from Bettina's Thunder a bit. Oh, hold on. Bettina's Thunder says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
all these material things that that are in focus in the next part of our passage which we'll look at next time so food drink and clothes will be given um, to those who seek god's kingdom when we lack generosity we become tight-fisted but double-mindedness can lead us to trying to serve two masters i think what jesus is trying to say is that either we're going to be focused on earthly things or on healthy things or on heavenly things there is a choice between the two three choices this is the choice of two visions one is full of light one is full of darkness and jesus says that blindness means that the whole body is blind the darkness is great it's something that affects our whole being and has far-reaching implications if we get it wrong. Okay, we're not going to discuss that because that was the tricky part. We'll have, get back in groups in a moment. But I just want to throw us into the next one. So moving quickly now into two masters. Remember, two treasures, two visions, now two masters. And the question of whose slave are we? Um, this metaphor is about slavery and Jesus would have had in mind the relationship of a slave to their master. It's quite different to the idea of having uh, being an employee and having an employer. It's quite possible to have multiple jobs, multiple bosses. Much, much more unlikely that you'd have multiple masters as a slave. He was simply the slave of one master. And with that in mind, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. And I think Jesus' comments here are deliberately black and white. They're very stark, aren't they? Just as a master requires uncompromising devotion of his slave, who is legally his property, so God wants the same from those who follow him. And Jesus' desires to serve both is simply an impossibility. And we see that throughout the history of Israel. Probably not going to read this slide, but um, it did pretty well serving, serving God during the lifetime of Joshua. But he's pretty sceptical at the end of his book about whether they would continue to do so. You don't have to look much further than the book of Judges to see that it didn't last long. Um, throughout the, the history, the question was, who are you going to serve? Are they going to serve God or are they going to chase after other gods? So we're going to go back into groups. And um, this time we'll have a, a few more minutes. Maybe maybe we'll move up to seven minutes this time, push the boat out. Um, and um, considering the language that Jesus uses here, so love and hate, devotion and despising, what would you say is the thrust of what Jesus is saying here? You might also like to look up Luke 14, 26 and Mark 7, 9 to 13, uh, which seem to be in contradiction. Um, and then secondly, to what extent do you agree that we cannot serve both God and money, which originally uses the word mammon? OK. Hope you had a good time talking about that. Um, I've got a few more things to say and then we'll just go back and have some reaction and maybe get a chance to pray in the groups. Um, so the language uses God, the language Jesus uses here is also very stark. So we've got love and hate, devotion and despising. Um, I don't know if you looked up the two references. But Luke 14, 26 says we cannot be his disciple unless we hate father and mother, wife and children brothers and sisters even their own life but that's quite in contrast to what he says in mark 7 um, verses 9 to 13 about honoring our parents and so we must conclude that this is to illustrate something um, and by making a contrast rather than being something that we take absolutely i think what jesus wants us to do is is that above all else our hearts should be directed towards god and everything else must be second to that final phrase you cannot serve both god and money um in the niv 
It says just that in the NKJV, it says you cannot serve God and mammon. In the NLT, it says you can't save God, serve God and be enslaved to money. In the J.B. Phillips, it says you cannot serve God and the power of money at the same time. And the Amplified Bible says you can't serve God and mammon. And then it amplifies mammon to mean money, possessions, fame, status or whatever is valued more than the Lord. What is what is mammon then? Well, some think it might be the name of a pagan god, or others think it might mean to trust or to confide, um, as we tend to do with our riches. But from the passage, the meaning seems to be clear enough as materialism or the personification of wealth. How can we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and strength if it is dominated by something else? All that we have can either be used for God's glory or it can be misused as idolatry. And it's, I'd have to say it's equally possible to serve mammon, whether we live in plenty or in want, whether we've got lots or we've not got very much. Because Jesus is still speaking about our hearts. If we're willing to sacrifice for the sake of money, then money is clearly our God. I wonder what our diaries, our priorities, our bank accounts say about what is most important to us. Came across this little story about Matthew Henry. He was robbed. And when he returned home, he wrote in his diary, he said, Lord, I thank you that I've never been robbed before. That although they took my money, they spared my life. That although they took everything, it wasn't very much. That it was I who was robbed not I who robbed. Totally different way of looking at things. So in this short passage this evening, Jesus has been asking us again and again to search our hearts. What do we treasure? What do we, what do we, uh, where is our vision? Whose slave are we? And the implications of these three questions are far reaching and incredibly challenging as Jesus calls us to worship him above all else. If we're storing up treasures in heaven rather than on earth, then that will be clear by what we do with our money, what we do with our wealth and our possessions, and what we'll do to obtain it. If our eyes are healthy rather than unhealthy, then our thoughts will be single-minded in our service to God. We will overflow with generosity towards the people around us. If we're seeking to serve God rather than be enslaved to the pursuit of money, wealth and possessions, will, uh, we will then learn a kind of inner contentedness uh, with whatever life brings our way. There's a little quote about contentment. Um, I want to just finish with this about our giving. We haven't really talked much about giving. There's been some references to generosity and things. But I quite like this Ray Steadman quote. And he says, one of the marks that heart has truly been touched by God is they count on giving as a privilege. And some thoughts about giving on the screen there. Um, but the, the Bible's overall message is that we have been made stewards of all that God has entrusted us with. We have responsibility for the things that God has given to us and continues to give to us. And so in that context, we're to give thoughtfully, generously in proportion to what we've been given sacrificially, willingly. The focus of our giving should be about extending God's kingdom, about the church, about hospitality and the poor, maybe specific ministries, special particular needs. When we love God above all else, we begin to see everything we have as resources in his service. This is my final slide. Um, it's verse three from, from the song, Be Thou My Vision. Um, let me read this as a kind of prayer to finish. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always, thou and thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, 
my treasure thou art. Dear Father, would you make that true of us as we live about live out our lives? Lord, we want to put you first in our hearts and to put you above all other things. Lord, would you help us not to fall into the trap of chasing after some of these things that we've talked about? Lord, help us to store up treasure in you. Help us to get our vision on you. And Lord, would you fill our lives with light? And Lord, would you help us to serve you alone as our master and not allow ourselves to be enslaved or mastered by anything else? Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.